Do you really think that that is possible? To have a transfer switch that is rather cheap and works? Let's find out. Here you can see it from the box. It looks quite decent though, but the uh, feeling of it is very, very plasticky. The CE marking or the quality marking is also something that is just a sticker that is put on. And the DIN rail is, yeah, plastic. Uh, the weight itself is around one kilo. And uh, it seemed to be a real good contactor inside, except for uh, perhaps the bearings. It actually has a pretty decent instruction manual with it, in terms of how you connect things up, the different diagrams, and some specifications of course as well. With that said, the certification that it comes with is not really something that makes it approved in, as example, in Sweden. But we will take a deeper look into it and you can decide yourself. But first, let's compare it. So let's take a look at the specifications. As you can see here, one of the main things is the switching time is less than 50 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds will result in a shutdown of your computer if you are unlucky. With that said, we are going to check that out in short. You will also have the other specifications in this image here. It says that it can switch up to 6000 times and connecting and breaking around 50 times. This is a little bit different depending on which site you go to. Some say 5000, some say 500. So you will take that in mind when you are working with this. It's not made to switch your power every day, every other minute. There also seem to be two different types of them out on AliExpress if you're checking that. I bought this one here that is called a Jutta. And you can also find another one that is actually this one here that is named Geia. This one is a lot more expensive. It's almost double the price. Which one is the better? I don't know, but they look, to be honest, the same. The page on the other hand on Geia is a lot better with a lot better explanation. And I will link both in down below. If you look at the Jutta, they only copied the page or the paper directly and added to it here. So here we have first of all the new one that I bought. Let's put it aside a little bit, but you can see the different sizes between different units. Here we have a manual three-phase unit that you can switch between zero, one and two. This is actually, this one is approved in Sweden, this type, because it have a zero in between the different parts. With that said, this one is totally manual, but that's actually what I'm using here in my house now, except mine is four pole instead of three. Automatic transfer switch on the other hand, here you have a three pole automatic transfer switch where you hook them together. And in between them you will have a mechanical interlocking, those are contactors, that you either draw this one or draw this one and power goes through. I have had videos before regarding this. As long as you have this side port here, you can hook them out up as an automatic transfer switch. I do recommend to have a timer attached to it though. This one always draws power on the other hand. You can also use contactors of this type here, except this one does not have mechanical interlocking functionality. But potentially this contactor can be used as an automatic transfer switch and this one is actually picked from a UPS system where it was the one switching between mains and the battery power. But today is all about this one here. So let's try to hook this out to the two different power sources. I'm going to test it with one phase, but that should be more than enough. And then we measure it with my oscilloscope and see the delay between switches. When that's done, we will pick this apart and see how it looks inside. I now have both sources picked up, so if I turn them manually, you will see that it blinks. And that's because I'm not that fast in switching. 
So that's the first step. We are now going to hook up regarding to this wiring here, one of the sources to this one here to make one or the other to be the primary. So let's test that out. Getting some wire for this. And it's clearly marked here BN, B source, neutral. And then we have BR. That's the R phase. And of course I don't have any power hooked up right now. That's important. So now we have one of the sides hooked up and potentially when running in auto it should switch and use the B source as the primary source. So let's try that out. I'm hooking out up the power again. B is now primary. And A is joined up as well. Let's switch. Now we have the A side active and we hit the B and we can see that it switched over. But if I kill this again, it will not switch back again. So let's hook up the other one. Let's cut the power. I now have both of the powers hooked up. Both A and B have power. And I do suspect that A is the primary always when hooked up like this. So let's try that out. Let's kill the B source. Nothing happens. That means that the A source is now active running that one. And you can hook up a light that actually shows which one is pulling power to the output. If we kill the A source instead, you'll see that it blinks over directly to the B source. And B source is now active. If I turn the A source back on again, it switches back to A source. And I think you can see it on the screen. Yeah, you see the blinking in the light there. That means that there is a small gap between A and B source. But the question is, how fast is the gap or how, how big is the gap between them? Let's hook up the oscilloscope and test it out. So basically here we have one of the triggers I did. This is how it looks like. You can clearly see that depending on how it works, it will cause an outage of this, in this case, 15 milliseconds roughly. So let's us re-trigger this again and see how it works. Uh, let's zoom out a little bit so we can get it on. Basically there we have trigger again, let's zoom in, and this is even worse, every um, box there is 10 milliseconds and here we have 30 milliseconds where it has no correct voltage. The trigger time here depends very much on how it actually slaps from one side to another and when you do it. You can also clearly see that there is no zero point trigger, of course, it, since it is a contactor, it starts in the middle of the pulse. So let us do another test and see how it does the next time. Let's run it again. Zoom out a little bit. There we have another trigger. Let me zoom in. And in this case, we had a uh, outage of around 10 milliseconds. And that's pretty decent. I mean, if you are between 10 and 15 milliseconds, most of the gear will survive. When you go towards 20 and above, you will get issues. 
And that's basic knowledge in terms of this. And the thing is, when you're using contactors, 10 to 20 milliseconds is very normal. And 20 and up is extremely normal on cheap Chinese gear that isn't rated for it. So this is the first thing. So far, what do I think about this device? Um, I think it works. Um, if it's illegal or not, it's another question. How long it will work is also another question. It is rated for a working current of 100 Ampere. And it says that the weight is around 2.6 kilogram. I highly doubt that, but let's check that out. What we need to do now is actually pick this apart and take a look at it. But before we do it, okay. One more thing is that no matter what you do, the primary source will always be the normal power. If you want to fiddle around with this, you need to disconnect this line here. And to do that, you need to make sure you have relays at the side that controls this part here. Either this one is active or this one is active. So you can do that with a normal relay that you switch on and off. As long as you have this one on, this side will be the primary side. If you are interested in how you can accomplish that you either have A or B as a primary, not only B, A as primary, let me know down in the comment and I might do a follow up video showing you how you can hook that up. But you would require one extra relay and one switch that is used to do this because you need to prioritize either or of the sides. Now let's get and weigh this up and peel it apart. When you are screwing the bottom side here, this one, the screw screwdriver will touch the upper here. So if you haven't disconnected everything, you easily can short this out. So if you're going to screw it like that, make sure you add some tape around the screwdriver so you don't mistakenly shorten this out. First, we'll take a look at those. Those seem to be soft copper wires. I can already now state for sure that they will never ever work with 100. After removing the top cover, we will see the contacts as well. And you can see that they are pretty decent in size. And there you see how they switch. There are basically no way they can short out on both sides at the same time, and that is very, very good. How the surfaces itself hold up, I don't know. But I would say that the striking distance there is good enough for our electronics. Um, I would have loved to be able to open up even more inside here and look at it, but I think I will leave it as is. I'm pretty happy with the result of it. This one works and I think it can be recommended for a short amount of time. You need to consider that this one is most likely not approved. And the quality itself, it says 100 Ampere. Don't go above that. And also make sure that you are aware of what you're doing before you are fiddling with something like this. Let's see if we can get it close again. So final um, thoughts about this device. First of all, 100 Ampere is not accurate. That's way too much. Secondly, it only handles normal power as the primary power. Uh, you need an extra relay and a, and a switch to actually be able to switch between those two live. Otherwise, you need to go to manual and strike this one like that. Thirdly, the contacts here are way too close to each other. You can short them up, as you can see there. That's a big no-no as well. And the fact that this one may not be approved, that's also a big disadvantage. Another thing is the backside here. You will see that this is very, very plasticky. And this one here, the holder, that should snap this in place on top of a DIN rail. I'm pretty sure this one will break rather quickly. I would have loved to see at least two or three of them in brass or some kind of metal instead. And that will have held up a lot better. With that said, there is one big advantage of this one. It's cheap 
and it actually seemed to do the work it should do pretty well. The decent uh, uh, time between one and the other side is low enough that it should be able to cope with most systems. With that said, if you want and if you have critical loads, buy a proper one from Snyder or ABB or something else. Don't buy this one, but if you are on a sheep and you just some, need something simple, this one could potentially work unless you actually go for the manual version that I am using, for instance, this one here. So guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.